So Psalm chapter 12. Okay, 6 and 7 was your memory verse, as we said. Now what's interesting about Psalm chapter 12, you might think, hey, the verses leading up to verse number 6 sort of, I, I kind of um, don't really go with uh, verse 6 and 7. But what we see here in Psalm chapter 12 is the difference between the words, the vain words of man, and then the words of God. Right, we talk about the words of man for the first few verses that we had a look at. It says that they, verse number two, they speak vanity. These are people that are against godly men. These are people that are against faithful men of God. They speak uh, vanity. They have flattering lips. Um, but the Lord, it says here in verse number three, the Lord shall cut off their flattering lips. Okay, the words of man are temporal. They don't have value for eternity. But what does have value for eternity is the word of God. What else does it say here? It says that, um, you know, the, the tongue speak of proud things. It's about the pride of man. Man likes to talk and, and, and sound knowledgeable, full of wisdom, puff themselves up, full of pride. But God says, hey, next to my word, it's all vanity. Next to my word, which is pure, which is preserved, which is kept for all generations. Next to my word, God says, the words of man is vanity. And he's going to cut those flattering lips. Uh, God promises that. But I'm not going to focus on the words of man. We're going to be focusing today on the words of the Lord. Some of the things that we see there from verse number 6 and verse number 7. Number 1, the words of the Lord are pure words. They are pure words. And when we talk about purity, we talk about something that's not defiled, right? It's pure, it's clean. There's nothing uh, evil or defiling those words. It compares the words of the Lord as silver tried in a furnace of earth. I'm not sure if you've ever held pure silver in your hands. It's pretty heavy, but the way they purify silver, the way they purify gold is to have it uh, in a furnace. They will literally heat up that silver once it's been mined, once it's been mined and taken out of the ground. It's not pure silver at that point. The silver is filled with imperfections, impurities. It's filled with dirt. It might be filled, it might be mixed with other metals. Okay, so what they do is they heat up the furnace, they put the silver in there, and the dross of the silver gets removed. And the Bible says, hey, God's word is like that silver being, being heated, that impurity being taken out of it seven times, the Bible says. And then it says here in verse number seven, who will keep the words of the Lord? Whose job is it to keep it forever, from this generation forever? Whose job is it to preserve it? It says, thou shalt keep them, O Lord. It's the Lord's job to preserve His Word. And the reason why we have God's Word today, and we don't have to doubt that we have God's Word today, is because it's God's job to, uh, to preserve them. We might say, hey, look, we see... And, and look, I'm not, I'm not doubting that there's been men for centuries that have held on to the manuscripts that we have today, that have lost their lives trying to translate the Bible into English, lost their lives for trying to just distribute the Bible in their areas. I, I agree with that. But it's been the Lord that empowered them to do that. It's the Lord that preserved His words. And then it says, for how long? How long did He preserve His words? Did He only preserve His words for the original manuscripts? Did He only preserve His words till the time of Christ? Did He only preserve His words for the first few centuries? No. Verse 7 says, Thou shalt preserve them from this generation. What generation? The generation that this was written in. The generation that wrote the Bible. From this generation forever. Okay? So we can... If we trust the Lord, if we're going to hold on to His promise, then we have to believe that God's preserved His Word from that generation till today and forever. All right? Now, a few Bible facts. A few Bible facts. Let's just get this. Because at the end of the day, when I say, when we have a church, are you, are you coming here to hear my opinion? I mean, are you coming here to see me? I, I hope not. I hope I'm just a vessel that God can use. All right? But the Bible is our authority. The Bible is, if you're going to stand behind this pulpit and, and me, I'm going to stand here and we're going to teach anything, it's going to come from the Word of God. Okay, there's enough. There's enough here. You're not going to get through the whole Bible in your whole life. You're going to read it, but you're not going to learn everything in the Bible for, in your whole life. So I'm not going to waste my time giving you my opinions and my thoughts if they differ from the Word of God. If you say, hey, God told me something. You know, I had some dream. God told me these words. All right, that's fine. You know, I'm not going to doubt your experience. But if they don't line up with the Word of God, if they're contrary to the Word of God, then it wasn't God that told you those things. The way, the, what's going to be taught behind this pulpit, what's going to be taught in this church, is the 66 books that you have before you that you can hold in your hand. Okay? The things that God's given liberally to everybody, 
not just to you and your private dream or a private interpretation. So the Bible, it was written during a period of about, altogether, the Bible was written in a period of about 1,600 years. That's a big time frame, right? From Genesis to Revelation, the whole Bible put together 1,600 years. There were about 40 different authors. I think people say 40 different authors for sure. There might be a few more than that. 40 different authors. Those authors were made up of fishermen, of kings, shepherds. There's a physician, Luke, right? The Gospel of Luke. He was a fish, uh, physician, a doctor. So you got men from all walks of life from those that are very powerful to those that are just looking after sheep. And what I find funny is some people say, oh, the, the Bible was written to control the masses, right? I mean, it was a shepherd's job to, to control the sheep, all right? Not the people, all right? He didn't write the Bible to control his sheep, right? This was written by all types of people from all walks of life. The shepherd had and the fishermen had no uh, desire to control the masses, right? They, they, had, they were just moved by the Holy Ghost to write the Word of God. The other thing about the Bible, um, you know, obviously it's not one book. I just mentioned already, it's 66 books. You know, the word Bible comes from the Greek word biblios. And if, you know, I'm Spanish, and uh, in, in, in Spanish, the word for library is biblioteca, which comes from Bible, biblios, which means, you know, many books. Like a library has many books. So the Bible itself is one book which contains... 66 books, many books. There's the Bible split up into two parts, right? The Old Testament and the New Testament. And uh, there's 39 books in the Old Testament and 29 books in the New Testament. Now, what's beautiful about the Bible is that it contains history, it contains prophecy, it contains poetry, songs, letters. You know, the Bible's got, it, it's, it's got so many genres. But what's so amazing about the Bible is, you, as you read it, you realize it's one mind. Yes, there's 40 different authors, but really there's one author, and that one author is God. And another interesting fact about the Bible, it's been translated to 2,454 languages. I, just got, I mean, it's probably more than that now, because there's always new languages that, are, that the Bible's being translated. That's, that's amazing, 2,454 languages. Obviously, different dialects and, and things of that nature as well. And you might say to me, Kevin, why do you believe the Bible? Why do you base your life upon this book? You know, um, why don't you trust some other holy books? Why don't you trust the opinion of, me of men and professionals and experts? Um, honestly, number one reason is I just grew up in a Christian home. <laughs> I've always, for me, the Bible has just always been the final authority. I've never had doubts that it's the Word of God. All right, but that's not going to win some people over. But here's the thing. Once you read the Bible and you read the Bible, you've had it for years and years and years, and you study God's Word, you realize that the Bible should be impossible. The existence of the Bible should be impossible. I mean, I'm not sure how many there are of us right now. There's probably about 30, 40 of us right now, right? If we talk about 40 different authors, if we took one sub, we, we all, we're all together, right? We're all here together. If we all decided, hey, let's just write one book, and we're, we're all authors, we're all going to write a different chapter in that book. All right, now let, let's just, I don't know, we'll just take a topic, we'll take Caloundra. We'll write about Caloundra, the, the, you know, the history, the people, the politics, you know, the community, what have you. And we all wrote a chapter. Do you think that book's going to be consistent? <laughs> do you think there's going to be errors in that book? Of course there is. You know, we all go away and do our own research. We all write a chapter each. Do you think there's going to be contradictions? Of course there is, right? If we're going to write just history, I'm going to say, hey, this was done first, and then this happened, and yet probably in your chapter you're going to write, well, that happened first, and then that, this happened. Like, there's going to be contradictions, and look, we're talking about something that should be straightforward, right? We're all together, we all live in the same place, we all live in the same time, but I promise you, if we try to write a book, we're going to mess it up, right? All of us wrote one book. The Bible is impossible. I mean, 40 different authors, 1,600 years. What's amazing is I can go to the New Testament, all right, in the, written in the first century, and then I can go back and read a book written hundreds of years before that, and I can compare those things, and they line up, and they make sense, and they make sense together. And these are authors that did not know one another. Right? We can read about Jesus Christ and the prophecies of Christ, and we can read about the prophecies that were written hundreds of years before Christ came to the earth, and yet He came and fulfilled those prophecies. It's amazing. The Bible should be an impossible book. And so that's why I believe the Bible, because it's impossible for man. 
2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21 says this, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is, given to, is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so the Bible is not something that's written by the will of man. It's not something man desires to write. I'll tell you why. Because the Bible shows man in a bad light. The authors themselves are shown in a bad light. You see their mistakes. If I was going to write about a book about myself, I'm sure I'm going to pick out the highlights, the things that make me look good. But this was written by man. And all we see is mankind in a bad light. And we see God in his perfect light. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And these men were moved by the Holy Ghost. God came upon them to write the words that he wanted written. They wrote the book and we have it today. We, we're, we're so blessed to have six, the 66 books in the canon all available to us, readily available, very easily. People throughout history, you know, did not have the whole Bible in their hands. They had manuscripts, bits and pieces. They did the best they could to copy them and distribute them. We have the blessing. We have the benefit of hard work of many hundreds of years of people that put the Bible together. Now, when we talk about Bibles, you're going to think, you know, when we talk about the English translation of the Bible, there's over a hundred English translations, right? So how are we going to choose the best one? Now, here's what's interesting. Even though there's hundreds of English translations, there's only really two Bibles. And if you have a bit of knowledge of Bible history, you'll understand this. But throughout the centuries, right, throughout the, yeah, throughout the centuries, people have been writing manuscripts, right? Greek manuscripts, the Hebrew manuscripts. What does manuscript mean? Well, you know what script means, right? It's to write. And then man, you script. It's a script that was written by man. When you talk about manuscripts, these are handwritten manuscripts that were copied of copies of copies. So when God moved Paul, for example, to, to write to the church in, in Corinthians, let's say, you know, Paul wrote or, or he had got someone to write, you know, a letter to the church in Corinthians. And then another church said, hey, I'd like to have a copy of that. So then someone took that copy and, and copied it out. And then someone, another church said, I would like to have a copy of that. And so someone else got that copy and copied it out. And then over the time, there's been hundreds and thousands of manuscripts that went out throughout the whole world. And then in the 1500s, there was a man by the name of Erasmus who um, collated over 5,000 manuscripts. And this is what's known as the, uh, the majority text. You might have used this, heard this phrase before, the majority text because it's the majority of the manuscripts that were copied together. And by the way, these weren't just copies, okay? It's, it was like a photocopy. People made sure that every word was in the right place every time they made a copy, okay? So when these uh, manuscripts were put together, if it didn't line up, like you could put a grid through these manuscripts, and if they didn't line up, they were discarded. The ones that were copied perfectly were the manuscripts that were kept. And there were over 5,000 during the 1500s by this Erasmus that put them together. He, made a, he edited a copy of the Greek text, which is known as the Textus Receptus, which is one of the basis of the King James Bibles, the King James Bible that we use. But there were other editors like Beza and other editors that made Greek uh, manuscripts, or, or, or sorry, made Greek text from the manuscripts. And all this body of text, 5,000, apparently there's about 9,000 manuscripts today, this is known as the majority text. These are texts that were used by Bibles for, uh, through churches throughout centuries. They were distributed throughout the whole world. And so it was easy to collect these texts. And by large, they agreed largely with one another. So you have two Bibles. You have one Bible that's built from this majority text. But then later on, about 150 years ago, 150 years ago, there was the minority text. And these texts come from not 5,000 manuscripts, not 9,000 manuscripts, but from two manuscripts, all right? Two manuscripts, a minority text. They were, the first one uh, was discovered in the Vatican Library, the Roman Catholic Church in the Vatican Library, known as the, Vat the Codex Vaticanus, discovered in 1481, um, which differed from the majority text. It had been changed, it had been edited. And then the second manuscript that make up the minority text is known as the Codex, Codex Sinai Atticus. It was found 
near Mount Sinai, which is why it's called Sinai Atticus, um, in a trash can in a monastery, in, in a monastery trash can, they found this other manuscript, the Sinai Atticus, that was discovered in 1844. Now, someone came up with the idea, well, actually, they, they tested it for, I don't know how they date tested it, but they tested the dates on these two manuscripts, and they said, wow, these two manuscripts are older than the majority text. They're older than those that we've collated. You know, the 5,000 that we've put together, these are older, and therefore, because they're older, they're better. That's their logic. Then Westcourt and Hort, two men, one, one, man, one man known as Westcourt, another man known as Hort, got together, took these uh, minority texts, these two manuscripts, and created their Greek, uh, their Greek text. Okay, it's called the Westcourt and Hort Greek text. And what you'll find is, when we talk about the most popular English Bibles, you've, like I said, you've only really got two Bibles. You've got the King James Bible, which has been built from the majority text, the text that people gave their lives for, okay? Or you have all these other versions that come from the minority text, which are missing verses, which corrupt the Word of God. Minority text, and that's where you get all your NIV, you know, um, the English Standard Version, etc. So really... How do we determine which is the right Bible? Straight away, you should know by what is being used by God's people throughout the centuries, the majority text, that's going to be the right Bible to use, right? I mean, just, just by knowing history and understanding what people have done, how people have sacrificed their lives to keep these manuscripts. Okay, but their logic, right? The logic of those of the minority texts of the West Cotton Hort Greek text is, well, these are older, therefore they're better. And they are older, okay? They are older. We'll give them that. We'll give them that, the fact that they are older. The reason they're older, though, is because no one used them, all right? We're talking about old manuscripts that were used and copied. Over time, they fall apart, right? And that's why new copies had to be made, and new copies had to be made. They were used. They were taken throughout, uh, you know, the, throughout the continents. They, they, were, they were destroyed. The original manuscripts don't exist anymore. Of course, the ones that aren't being used the ones found in a trash can, the one found in a library that no one touches, that have been rejected by the believers throughout the centuries, of course they're older, because they're just sitting there, being preserved, hidden somewhere. Um, but God, in His knowledge, said, hey, I'm not going to have the whole world just rely on two manuscripts. I'm going to make sure the whole world receives thousands of manuscripts. My word goes out to every believer that we can understand His word. Now, here's what's interesting about that. They'll say the older is better. But that doesn't make any sense anyway because there are translation, Bible translations that are older than the Sinaiticus and older than the Vaticanus manuscripts. These are translations from the second century, right? Translated about 150 AD. Some of these old Bibles is the Peshitta Bible, the Old Latin Vulgate, the Waldensian translations. And what's interesting about these ones that are older than the minority text is that they line up perfectly. They agree with the majority text. So if we're going to go with older is better, then the majority text wins anyway because the translations, the early translations, used the majority text. You see that? So don't get fooled into this idea where older is better. Well, we can use that as well. And older is better, all right. Then the majority text wins. The thousands of texts, uh, manuscripts that were used, they win. All right, so we have two main Bibles in the English language, even though there's a hundred Bible translations. Now, I had a look. What are the best-selling English Bibles? I'm not sure if you guys are aware. I just got the top five, looked at a few websites. But right now, number one is the NIV, the New International Version. And even though they have a, a TNIV, they've updated their NIV, the NIV still outsells the TNIV. That's number one. Number two, it's the King James Bible. Number three, it's the New Living Translation. Number four, it's the New King James Bible. Now, don't get fooled into thinking that the New King James Bible has anything to do with the King James Bible. It does not. Now, I'll prove that shortly. And number five was the English uh, Standard Version, the ESV, English Standard Version. <coughs> now, number one, let me give you a reason number one. Why the King James Bible? Why do I believe that the King James Bible is the right Bible for us to use? Why do I believe it's God's perfect, preserved Word of God? Number one, I already talked about this, but God promised to preserve His Word. All right, number one, why I believe in the King James Bible is because God promised to preserve His Word. That means we have a preserved Bible today. 
Now, think about this for a minute. Have you ever heard anyone, do you, do you know of any groups that say the NIV is the perfect preserved word of God? Do you know anyone that says the New King James Bible is the perfect preserved word of God? Anyone that says the English Standard Version is the preserved, perfect preserved word? No. Even the editors themselves and people that read the, those Bibles say, hey, it's a good translation. Hey, it might be a good translation, but it's a good translation of a corrupt Greek text. All right? The only group of people that I know that, that dares say there's a perfect preserved word of God in English are those that read the King James Bible. All right? And so some will say, no, no, the perfect, the preserved word of God is in the original manuscripts, the original writings of the prophets. Well, they don't exist anymore. So either God's lying, right? Or, the, or they're out there somewhere, but no one knows where they are. Okay? So I'm telling you, if God promised to preserve his word, I'm going to tell you, well, I can actually put that book in your hand. All right? Another thing, um, yeah, I, I just say that. People say, well, I mean, I, I'll ask them. That. They'll say, well, you know, you shouldn't believe that the King James Bible is preserved and perfect. And I'll just say, well, do you believe that God promised them to preserve his word? Generally, they'll say yes, but if you say, hey, all right, put it in my hands. I want to read it. Show me what it is. They can't do it. They can't produce it, right? So they don't even believe what they say they, they believe. Another interesting thing about the King James Bible is that it is the only book in the history of, of, of mankind that has sold one billion, or maybe not sold, but there's been produced one billion copies that's 1,000 million copies of the King James Bibles that have gone out throughout the world. It's the number one bestseller of all time. I mean, if God's going to write a book for mankind, don't you expect it to be the number one bestseller? Don't you believe that it's, it's going to be the most produced Bible of all time? Surely, surely that's true. Now, the, you might say, what's the next bestselling or, or most produced book of all time? Is it another Bible translation? No, it's... It's something called the quotations from Chairman Mao Zedong, which had 900 million. It's, it's a Chinese um, booklet during its communist years, and uh, it was basically pro mass produced so every Chinese uh, resident would have a copy of it. All right? Uh, but I don't think it's produced anymore because um, this guy doesn't even, I, I don't know, I think he's dead now. Anyway, so it's not even, the next best selling book is not even a Bible. The best selling book of all time is a Bible, and it just happens to be the King James Bible. The other thing is, people have a problem sometimes with, with calling this the King James Bible. I kind of do as well, because you're, we're kind of appealing to King James. Now, I don't have anything against King James of England, but did you know when the Bible was translated in 1611, it wasn't known as the King James Bible, it was just known as the Holy Bible. It was just the Holy Bible for 200 years, all right? The reason why we call it the King James Bible today is just to be able to differentiate it from the other hundreds of translations that have been done. So, so people know what I'm referring to. If I say the Bible, they won't know which Bible I'm referring to. So we call it the King James Bible today. So it was known as the Holy Bible till 1814. And that was around the time when all these new you know, manuscripts started to be uh, found and, and new Bibles translated. All right, number two. Why do I believe the King James Bible is a perfect preserved word of God? And why are we going to use it in this church? Number two, because God's word is not bound or restricted. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. If you've got your Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Fill it up and give me a second cup with the same amount. Two cups. Second Timothy chapter 2, 8 and 9. Paul writes, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Verse 9. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. So Paul says, Hey, for the gospel of Christ, I suffer trouble. I, I'm seen as an evildoer and I, I'm in bonds. I'm in prison. I, I've been bound, you know, I've got cuffs on me. He's saying, I've been bound, even unto bounds, uh, sorry, unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. The word of God is not bound. The word of God cannot be restricted. It cannot be stopped. So the second reason why I believe in the King James Bible is because the King James Bible is not bound. It's not restricted. Now, if you've looked at, I had a look at this, I've looked at the copyright status 
of these five or sorry, of these four other Bibles, the most popular English Bibles, and pretty much all of them say the same thing. Let me quote to you from the NIV. Slightly different, the things they have about copyright, but essentially it's the same thing. It says, the NIV text may be quoted in any form, written, visual, electronic or audio, up to and inclusive of 500 words, oh, sorry, 500 verses without express written permission of the publisher, providing the verses do not amount to a complete book of the Bible, nor do the verses quoted account for 25% or more of the total text of the work in which they are quoted. In other words, <clears throat> if you wanted to use your NIV, produce it, give it out, you've got to be very careful not to use more than 500 verses. Because once you do that, you need to ask permission from the publisher. And what they mean by asking permission from the publisher, you've got to pay them, right? You've got to pay them royalties, right? They want to, you know, this is what copyright is. It's not freely available to be distributed. But the Bible says God's word is not bound. Now, if the NIV is bound, that tells me it's not the word of God, right? If the English Standard Version is bound, it's not the word of God. I've looked at the King James Bible, and this is what I found <clears throat> When I looked up the copyright status of the King James Bible, it said, the King James Version is public domain in the United States. Public domain. And then I had a look at Australia. Same thing. Public domain in Australia. Meaning, you guys, you guys can make your own Bibles. You guys can take the, the words of God, put together your own Bible, co photocopy it, distribute it, put it on your tracks, read it in church, put it up on a screen, whatever you want, without fear of it being bound, without being, fear of it being restricted. That's number two, why I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God, because it is not bound, just like, as like the other versions are. <coughs> number three, why I believe the King James Bible is the perfect Word of God, is because it is the indisputable English standard. Indisputable English standard. And you say, well, it's indisputable to you, Kevin. No, it's indisputable to all these other translations. Now, if you have your other Bibles, there's often like an introductory page or something about that Bible, why it was translated. And I had a look at some of these and I'll just pull out what they've written. So the NIV, the New International Version says this. <coughs> the initial vision of the project was provided by a single individual, an engineer working with General Electric in Seattle by the name of Howard Long. Long was a lifelong devotee. Now notice this. Long was a lifelong devotee to the King James Version. But when he shared it with his friends, he was distressed to find that it just didn't connect. Oh no. Long saw the need for a translation that captured the truths he loved in the language that his contemporaries spoke. So this Howard Long supposedly is a lifelong devotee to the King James Version. What you'll find with all these introductive letters, they always go back to the King James Bible. They always go back to the standard. They always, they can't help but talk about the King James Bible. It reminds me about the, uh, when we read about the, the evil spirits that possessed man. They can't help but say, Jesus is the Son of God. They can't help but quote the standard. It's the same thing. You know, and, and oh, poor guy, he just found the King James Bible just didn't connect with his peers. Now, look, I go soul winning every week. I use my King James Bible. I quote the verses from the King James Bible. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You know, these verses, I, I read them out to people that are unchurched. You know, people that have never read the Bible cover to cover. I've never had one person stop and say, what are you saying? What language are you speaking? Is this even modern English? I've never had that happen once. And yet this lifelong devotee had to somehow, you know, it just wasn't working for his mates. Come on. This guy didn't believe the King James Bible. But do you notice how they have to go back and say, well, he was a devotee. He loved the King James Bible. They have to say that because they know the standard that's respected throughout the whole world is the King James Bible in the English language. <clears throat> how about the English Standard Version? The English Standard Version. I found this funny. In the introduction they, introductory, they say this. The words and phrases themselves, so the words and phrases of the English Standard Version, grow out of the Tyndale King James Legacy, and most recently out of the Revised Standard Version. So they're saying the words and phrases come from the Tyndale. If you don't know what the Tyndale, that's a previous version before the King James Bible. It comes out of the Tyndale King James Legacy, 
and most recently out of the Revised Standard Version. But then it says this, with the 1971 Revised Standard Version text providing the starting point for our work. So I don't understand that sentence. It says, hey, the words come from the legacy of the King James, but, I mean, that, that's comma, and then, but the text, the starting point of the text comes from the Revised Standard Version. What in the world? What are you saying? Oh, it's like, again, just to say, we respect the King. I want you to realize we respect the King James Bible. All right, but actually, we're not even going to go there. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll say we're starting there. We're not actually starting there. We're starting with the Revised Standard Version to create the English Standard Version. It's, it's funny how they always have to go refer back to the King James Bible. It's like they have to show, hey, yeah, we, we respect it. We respect it. No, you don't. The New King James Version. The New King James Version. Now, again, a lot of people are fooled into thinking the New King James Version is the King James Bible with just updated language. Just the vowels have replaced with the, with the U's and, and just up-to-date English spelling. Look at this. Commissioned in 1975 by Thomas Nelson Publishers, 130 respected Bible scholars, church leaders, and lay Christian worked for seven years to create a... Look at this. They worked to create a completely new modern translation of Scripture. So is it based on the King James Bible? No, they're working to create a completely new modern translation of scripture and then it says this yet one that would retain the purity and stylistic beauty of the original king james all right so we're creating a brand new bible has nothing to do with king james has nothing to do with king james translators completely new but we're going to call it the new king james because we're trying to follow its beauty and style i mean it is beautiful the king james bible is beautiful but it shouldn't be called the New King James Bible. If it was commissioned by Thomas Nelson Publishers, it should be just known as the Thomas Nelson Publishers Bible. But who's going to buy that, right? Who's going to buy the Thomas Nelson Publishers Bible? That's why they had to call it the New King James Bible because they know they're going to fool people into buying it. Again, just referring back. Now, the New Living Translation, I couldn't really find any notes about the New King, like the, 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 the introductory notes. But I did go to their website, and this is what I found. <coughs> It says this, in the past 150 years, scholars such as uh, Tischendorf, Tregellers, Westcott and Hort, so these are again the minority texts that we spoke about, Nestle and Allen have produced editions of the Greek New Testament based on the evidence of the earlier and superior, right, we talked about that, manuscripts. In these editions, most of the scribal expansions that appear in the Textus Receptus have been eliminated. What are they saying? They're saying, hey, See, because these minority texts are missing verses, they're missing words, they're missing large chunks of the Bible. But they're saying, hey, because we've got these more superior uh, manuscripts, we've been able to remove those scribal expansions, those things they've added to the Bible, we've been able to remove. See how they make the text receptors, the majority texts, look insignificant. But then they say this, um, thus, modern translations based on these Greek manuscripts also differ, pay attention to this, are they the same Bibles? In their own words, thus modern translations based on these Greek editions also differ from the King James Version, version especially in the Gospels. Especially in the Gospels, where most of the scribal editions occurred. Seen in this light, the reader must realize that modern translators have not removed anything from the Scriptures, Rather, they have simply translated a Greek text that is closer to the original Greek New Testament. Now, this is the funny bit. This is where they refer to the King James Bible again. If the translators of the King James versions were alive today, right? If the translators that translated the King James Bible, if they were alive today, they would have done the same. In their day, they used the best Greek text available to them. Do you see that? We're just like the King James translators. If they had the manuscripts we have today, if they had the corrupt manuscripts we had today, they would have done the same thing. They would have gone with these other manuscripts, just like we did. Do you see how they appeal to a standard? They appeal to the English standard. These publishers know what is the perfect preserved word of God in English. They know what the standard is. And that's why they have to say, well, hey, it served a good purpose, but now we've got to give you another version. Do you notice that they never point to each other? The NIV never says, well, the English Standard Version was good for its, you know, for its time, and so we need to update now to the NIV. No, they never refer to one another. They always refer back to the King James Bible. <clears throat> now, 
why would the king, they, they think they know what the King James translators would have done if they had, no. But here's the thing, the King James translators had, they already knew of those other manuscripts because the Vaticanus, the Codex Vaticanus was found in 14 something, right? 14 whatever, and the King James Bible was translated in the 1600s. So they had a good 100 and 100, 150 years, you know, knowing about this, this manuscript, and yet they rejected it, they didn't use it. So no, the King James translators would not have used the manuscripts they use. But do you notice how they acknowledge that there are two different Bibles? They say there's a majority, and then there's one that's very different, especially in the Gospels, where we learn about Jesus Christ. Uh, number four, the, the reason why I believe the King James Bible is a perfect, preserved word of God is because it is perfect. It's without error. And I'm going to use, I asked my son to get me two cups of water. We're going to use an object lesson right now. All right, now both of these cups, and this is, you know, this is what you learn from Sunday school when you teach Sunday school for many years, right? You've got to learn, teach the kids stuff. So I hope you guys, uh, let's see, let's put these two cups here. Let's just say this one on my right is the, represents the King James Bible. And the one on the left represents all these other uh, modern translations using the minority uh, Greek text, the West Corden Horton, and so on and so forth. <coughs> all right. Now, the King James Bible, I said it's perfect, it's pure, it's without error. Who killed Goliath? I'm going to let, yes? David. David killed Goliath. Now, if I go and knock a door of someone that doesn't go to church, that's never read the Bible, Will they know who killed Goliath? Don't know, right? I mean, if you watch sport, and quite often you'll have a strong team versus a weak team, you know, the commentators will say, it's a David and Goliath battle, you know? Everyone knows the story of David and Goliath, all right? Now, turn with me to 2 Samuel 21. 2 Samuel 21 in your King James Bible. 2 Samuel 21, verse 19. 2 Samuel 21, verse 19. <clears throat> I'm sorry if I go a bit long today, but I really want to cover this topic. 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 19. Now I'm going to read it to you first. What you've got there, I'm going to read it to you from the English Standard Version. Verse 19. And there was again war with the Philistines at Gob. And Elhan El Elhanan, the son of uh, Jerogim, the Bethlehemite, struck down Goliath the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. So according to the English Standard Version, Elhanan struck down Goliath the Gittite. Now was it Elhanan or was it David? Let's read it from the King James Bible. 2 Samuel, chapter, uh, 2 Samuel 21, verse 19. It says, And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines, where Elhanan, the son of Jeri Origam, a Bethlehemite, slew who? Goliath? No. Slew the brother of Goliath the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. So which one's correct? Which one's accurate? Who did Elhanan kill? According to the King James Bible, he killed the brother of Goliath. According to the English Standard Bible, who did he kill? He killed Goliath. We know that's wrong. We know it was David that killed Goliath. And so the reason why I reject the English Standard Version, it's because it's not perfect. It's got errors in it. And if this represents the English Standard Version, all right. There's a lot of good water in there, but I'm just going to spit a little bit of error in that. All right, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. Now, I'm going to read this from the New King James Version. The New King James Version. All right? The Thomas Nelson Publishers Version. All right? You read it from the King James. It says here, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Let me ask you, are you being saved or are you saved? When Christ died on the cross and we believed upon Him, we trusted His sacrifice, his death, burial, and resurrection, were we saved? Absolutely born again, right? Saved for all eternity. One time event, we're saved. According to the New King James, we're being saved. In other words, it's, it's a process. You've got to work for it. You've got to work for it. What does the King James Bible say here in verse 18? For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved. 
which are saved. It is the power of God. Past tense. We are saved. We know we're going to heaven. We have eternal life, eternal security. Are saved. Um, I'll just read another one from the New King James. You don't need to turn there. Hebrews 10, 14. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Being sanctified. And yet the King James Bible says, no, are sanctified once and for all. Okay, so the New King James Bible, you messed up the gospel. You made salvation a process rather than just a one-time believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And so to the New King James Bible, I'm getting disgusted doing that. Sorry. <laughs> I, just want to, I just want to prove my point. <laughs> John 3.16. Go to John 3.16. Go to John 3.16. The most famous verse in the whole Bible. John 3.16. You guys should know it. Some of you know it off by heart. Okay, I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. The New Living Translation. <clears throat> For this is how God loved the world, that he gave his one and only son. Now, what's different there from your King James Bible? He gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. You might say, what's wrong with that, Kevin? What's wrong with that? That sounds pretty good. I mean, it sounds pretty good. But here's the problem. Did, does God have one and only son? Does God have one and only son? What does it say in the King James Bible? That he gave his only, what? begotten son according to the king james bible jesus is god's only begotten son and the king james bible is very consistent whenever jesus is referred to as an only son it's the only begotten son very consistently go to john chapter 1 just a few pages back john chapter 1 verse number 12 john chapter 1 verse number 12 is jesus the only son of god john chapter 1 verse 12 but as many as received him, have you received Christ? But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And so if you've believed on the name of God, you have been given the power to be the son of God, the sons of God. I'm a son of God because I've believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So is Jesus the only son of God? No, because if he was the only son of God, then I would not be a son of God. You would not be a son of God, right? inconsistent and look at let me just show you this in verse number just to show you the, the consistency of the king james bible verse 14 and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as the only what begotten of the father and uh, i didn't write down what the new living translation says there but again it says the only son okay so it's it's inconsistent it's wrong it doesn't make sense if it was true then we wouldn't be sons of god so to the new Live in translation, another little bit of error, right? Um, <clears throat> now, the New International Version. Go to Re Revelation chapter 22. Revelation 22. Last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22. Verse number 16. Revelation 22, 16. Um, you look at the King James Bible, I'll read it from the NIV. <clears throat> I, Jesus, so who's speaking? Jesus, right? I, Jesus, have sent my, my, uh, I have sent my angel to give you a testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. So according to the NIV, Jesus is the morning star, right? When I read that in the King James Bible, uh, what was it again? Six, verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So we have an agreement with the NIV and the King James Bible that Jesus Christ is the morning star. Do you see that? That's one of his titles. That's one of his names. Jesus Christ, the morning star. If, if you, you know, it says there from, I, Jesus. He says, I'm saying this, right? Now go with me to Isaiah 14. Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. Jesus Christ, the morning star. Isaiah 14, verse 12. Isaiah 14, verse 12. If you're there, I'll read it from the New International Version. <clears throat> I hate reading this. It says this. 
How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. Let me read that again. How you, this is the NIV. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star. Who's the morning star? Jesus. Who's, according to the NIV, who's falling out of heaven? Jesus, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. You who once laid low the nations, you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. So if this is Jesus, then he's not God because he's trying to raise himself above God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the uttermost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. So according to the NIV, Jesus is trying to be like the most high. No, he is the most high. He's God. And then verse 15, but you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. That's apparently to the NIV, that's Jesus, the morning star cast out of heaven, trying to be like God. But what does the King James Bible say? Verse 12, Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? It's Lucifer that was fallen from heaven, son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weakest the nations, weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will raise, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou, hast be, uh, thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So who's cast out of heaven? Who's cast to hell? It's Lucifer, Satan. He's trying to be like the most high. But do you think Satan wants us to know that? That's why he gave us these corrupt Bibles. Because he doesn't want you to know that he's been cast out of heaven. He wants you to think that it's been Jesus. In fact, he just says that plainly. It's Jesus that's cast out of heaven for trying to be like the most high. No, Satan, Lucifer was cast out of heaven. And so the NIV, that, that's what made me just end up just chucking my NIV in the, in the trash can. I was done with it. How dare you? Say this about Jesus Christ. How dare you? So, I mean, it's, it's right in the, in the in King James. The King James Bible does not call Lucifer the morning star. It doesn't shy away from using his name, but the NIV surely does. And so to the NIV, I'll have to do it a couple of times for the NIV. Uh, all right. Again, I'm sorry if I'm going a bit long. Where am I? So, some people say to me, well, Kevin, you know, it's very prideful, right? Now, look, look, here's the thing. They'll say, they'll say, Kevin, look, you know, these other Bibles, they've got some good stuff in it. There's still some truth. And, and I, I, yeah, I acknowledge that, right? I wasn't saved reading the King James Bible. I was reading some other version, right? But I had someone preach the gospel to me, all right? And there's still a lot of clean water, right? But, I mean, which one would you rather drink? Wh which one are you going to drink? Right? Are you going to drink that one that's got good stuff in it, but it's also been corrupted? Is it pure? It's not pure. It's not pure anymore, right? It's, it's corrupted. And yet you've got the King James Bible, which is without error. It's without contradictions. Every so-called contradiction they try to find has been explained very easily. Right? It's perfect. It's pure. So why? Why go for that? And that's what you're doing. You wouldn't drink that. You wouldn't nourish your physical body with that. But that's what you're doing if you're reading these corrupt Bibles. You're nourishing your spiritual body with imperfections, with impurities. And God's Word's pure. That's the promise God's given us, right? And someone will say to me, I've, I've had it said to me, Kevin, it's, it's very prideful, very prideful for you to believe you have the perfect preserved Word of God in English. No. It's very good. I'm very humble. I believe God. I just trust Him that He's going to have a pure Word for me for all generations, that it's perfect and preserved and it tastes good. That's not pride, right? Just believe in the Lord. That's humility. This is pride. I know it's not perfect, but I'm going to drink it anyway. That's pride, all right? When you know, hey, why, why? When you've got the perfect word of God available to you, when God's promised you, why? Why go for the corrupt? Why be prideful yourself and go for the corrupt word of God? The next reason, I don't know, I'm up to reason number five. I'll be quick now. I'm wrapping up. What did God promise us in Psalm 12? How, how often is God's words purified in a furnace? How many times? 
seven times, right? And the number seven in the Bible, I'm not big on Bible numerology, but there is a lot of truth in that. Number seven is a number of completion, right? We often see number seven as, as a complete number. We, we think of the seven colors of the rainbow. By the way, the Sodomites get that wrong. They've got six colors on their rainbow. I don't know what, that's not a rainbow, right? I guess they don't want to acknowledge the real rainbow because they know God destroyed the earth and then showed us a real rainbow. And he's going to destroy the earth again, trust me. Um, but here's the thing. Um, seven colors of the rainbow, seven notes on, on, on musical, seven musical notes, seven days in a week. And there's probably other things I can't think of right now. Um, even in Chile, you know, in, in, in my, uh, well, not my, Australia's my country, but in, in my, my parents' homeland, if a child does a test and gets, you know, we'd say if they got perfect results, we'd say they, they got 100%, right? In Chile, they'll say they got a seven. That's how they mark. It's seven, and then you do what? Well, you get a six. And so seven's perfection. Um, so, you know, it's been purified seven times. Now, here's what, a few interesting facts about the King James Bible. Number one, it took seven years for it to be translated. Okay, from 1604 to 1611. Seven years for the King James Bible to be translated. Another interesting thing about, think, uh, fact about the King James Bible. It is the seventh major Bible translation like in a universal kind of like language. Number one, it was the Hebrew, right? the Hebrew Old Testament scriptures. Number two, the Aramaic, some of the Old Testament scriptures such as Dan and Ez Daniel and Ezra um, uh, uh, are in Aramaic. Number three, in the Old Greek, the Koine Greek, right? Not just the Greek New Testament, but even the Old Testament Hebrew were translated into Greek. Number four, it was the Syriac. The Syriac, um, there's about 300 plus uh, copies of the Syriac you know, uh, manuscripts that were found throughout the world, even as far as China, you know, in the early centuries. Then it was Latin, and then German, and then English. Isn't that interesting? Seven major translations in, you know, what would be referred to as universal languages. That's languages that were used for people that were of different nations to communicate. The seventh major Bible translation. The other interesting thing about the King James Bible, it is the seventh English Bible in the line of the majority manuscripts, the, the, the received text, all right? The King James Bible didn't just w work off the, the Greek and the Hebrew manuscripts, but also on previous work of previous English translations of that same family tree, of that same line. Number one, the Tyndale Bible, the Matthews Bible, the Cloverdale, Bo Cloverdale Bible, the Great Bible, the Bishop's Bible, the Geneva Bible, and number seven, the King James Bible, purified seven times. So those are my reasons why we're going to hold to this Bible. I think it's straightforward, common sense. You know, it's, I've never had a problem reading it. Well, I did have a problem reading it because I was using my corrupt Bibles earlier. But once I, you know, it's, it's not difficult. You know, I, I read it to people every week, preaching the gospel. They don't have a problem understanding that. So the only Bible that's going to be allowed in this church is the King James Bible. The only Bible that's going to be allowed to go preach the gospel and in, in future ministries is the King James Bible. Okay, if you don't have one, let me know. I'll give you a copy. Okay, if you haven't got one, I'll give you a copy. All right? All right, let's pray.